Hi, I'm Mark Rosano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings coming to you from Primary Vision Network. So today we have our frack spread show where we're going to talk about activity that's happening in the market, but we're also going to look at some of the additional information that's come out over the last couple of hours, you know, given that we've had some decent moves uh, on some key topics that are really going to drive what is going to happen on crude demand, diesel demand. And I think those are some key uh, components that we want to hash out once again. So with that being said, the uh, frack spread count went up by five. We went from 290 to 295. You know, we we had some decent pickup in the south, which is normal. As we said last week, that dip is normally seasonal, and you usually get one more push before the slowdown that that really picks up between Thanksgiving, and then it continues and lasts straight through till the new year. So one of the things was we initially thought we were going to get to about 300, 305. Instead, this will likely be the top. We might get one more push to about 297, maybe 300. But just based on the Permian at this level, pretty much tapped out. You know, when you look at some of the other areas, you're getting close and butting up against the available capacity. So this is something that, it, you know, could we get another five? Sure. You know, I think if anything, it's to 297, but we should start to see a bit of a decline as we go into Thanksgiving. And then from Thanksgiving, you have another drop off. But as we showed the seasonal chart last week, we just see something that will be a bit more muted in terms of that drop down just because we haven't gone up as high, which is very similar to what happened last year. And I think that that's something that is going to continue. And it happened as well in 2017. And when you look at that ramp up and what the preparation is, we keep talking about rig counts. So rig counts is a very good way of just looking at, you know, where are things going to be in the next six, 12 months? And and things continue to pick back up. So we had an increase of nine on the oil side, three directional, but more importantly, six on the horizontal front. So you also have, you have to look at this on two different ways. They try to do as much as they can. At this point, it's, it was fairly warm. Make sure you get as many of these holes drilled as you can. Then you can have a, a little bit more of a, of a stand down as we go through the, the next six weeks. But realistically, this is setting up well to make sure that we're, we're fairly su- supported or supplied for activity as we go into 2023. And again, it's more along the lines of just maintaining a certain amount of activity through this time period. They want to make sure that we're in a position where there's enough uh, uh, enough uh, ducks to make sure that we have that production that we need as we go into next year and then start off strong in Q1. Because I really think that based on where frack spreads are, where rig counts are, are sitting, the amount of uh, drilled but uncompleted wells, sets up well for a, a a robust Q1. Then when you look at the market in general, CPC blend loadings are rising to that nine-month high. Uh, it's about 1.5 million barrels a day in December, or just based on the loading program, which is a solid movement. It's going to be interesting to see how or if CPC gets impacted because for those that haven't seen, Russia has now pulled back. They've given up Kherson. They've moved to the uh, to the to the uh, uh, what would that be southern the southeast side of um of the Dnieper, uh and that's that's a good thing in terms of you know what the ukrainians have achieved but what is going to be the the output you know what how is russia going to lash out is it going to be shutting down cpc blends in terms of what can come through that that area are they going to shut down or or uh, pause the the free movement of or the protected movement of grains from the ukrainian coast these are some key things that are going to be important to watch because they're going to have strong in, in indications and strong reactions in the market if they shut down or if there's some CPC issue, you're going to see Brent spike. If you see uh, comments around what is going to happen with grains, you're going to see grain spike again, even though they've already started to move, which I think the data that we talked about in the econ show is finally working through. So these are going to be interesting pieces of how are they going to respond because they're digging in. There's no more offensive. They're now fully on the defensive and they're going to try to do something to lash out and to offset. And the last time they had a big loss, that was when they had paused the UN backed um, uh, grain movement from the, uh, from the Ukrainian border. 
When we look at the consumer sentiment, the decline for November consumer sentiment was down to 54.7 versus the estimate of 50. 50- 9.5 expectations also fell to 52.7 so you can see we're right back to the lows and and we see some of this getting worse as we go through the remainder of the year because we do see a slowdown in holiday shopping and, and realistically for those that are parents if you can't afford stuff that you thought you were going to be able to or for your kids you're not going to feel the same way. You're not going to look at things the same way, especially when you factor in where your home price have, has gone, where as you look at your 401k going into next year, where those allocations are, that's going to have a bigger impact. Now, even as this this happens, you should see it diminish in terms of, you know, demand, uh, crude demand, other things. As we've talked about, you know, shale, uh, you know, when you look at what is happening on the distillate side, there's a shortage there. Not much you're going to do on pricing. Sure, people may drive a little bit less, but we're already at a pretty stable number, so we don't see that dropping. So, how you know, does it mean you're going to take less flights? Probably not. You know, a lot of the flights right now are still business oriented. So, you should see you know demand is kind of here. It couldn't. It can always go lower, as we've seen in previous years. But this is there's a little bit of st- of stability, which is why when you look at the sh- uh, at, at shale and the backlog, you know even if we get a bigger demand crunch in the U.S., it's really not going to stop drilling to any meaningful degree because we still are sending 3.8 3.9 million barrels a day into the international markets. Europe is still short. If CPC gets shut down or is diminished because of Russia, that's a problem. What is the stability of, of Libya? That's a problem. You know, how is Asia going to get crude uh, cargoes with uh, with with the OPEC? Uh, some of the OPEC cuts impacting the Middle Eastern blends. Well, they're going to try to spot blend and they're going to pick up more U.S. crude. So even as we talk on a negative side, when you look at some of the economic backdrops, there is still support for U.S. activity. And and again, one, one thing that we've been very clear at, we're not going to get a surge in activity, but a lot <clears throat> excuse me, of stability in that level when you look at where things are at that 12.2 into that 12.3 and really pushing to about 12.7 million barrels a day. When you look at the uh, the index in general, you can see that there was a pretty steady decline across the board, which is, again, moving people's views down on where the market is. Now, you've had a big rally. You know, People may feel a bit better. That, that will, will maybe boost this as you look into December. But as we've been saying, we believe it's going to be short-lived. And here's one of the key reasons why. So there's now convergence is now decisive when you look at the between the core goods, the blue and core services, the former is rolling over swiftly, which is what we've been talking about still relative, but it's still elevated relative to history. So even though the good side has come down, we're still at levels that we haven't been at since the 1980s. And then while this the uh, the uh, service side is growing at the fastest pace since August of 1982, there and then the service side tends to be more sticky when you look at that holding p- uh, pattern on the core side. So again, uh, this is going to keep inflation, that stagflation fairly firm. And now we want to look at the zero COVID policy because it's really important for all things, cons- all things considered from crude demand, uh, you know, activity uh, it, with in- internally copper, nickel, every commodity you can think of, is China going to absorb more? And I think Trivium did a really good job of describing it in today's uh, number, uh, uh, quick uh, blurb. So there's two sides to the story. There's going to be the the PBSC, the uh, Pol- uh, Politurbo uh, Standing Committee, and then the National Health Committee, because one is going to tell you what needs to happen and then give an outline, and then the other is going to give some direct uh, directives. So what did the PBSC say? Well, they said we will unswervingly implement the general policy of dynamic clearing, which is what they consider zero COVID. But we will protect people's lives and health to the greatest extent possible and minimize the impact of the epidemic on economic and social developments. So that's key. But in this meeting, the PBSC did begin to place an increased emphasis on reducing the socioeconomic fallout of the harshest elements. Now, it's going to be interesting to see how they manage that as they see you know, we all know it's contagious. I mean, I, the last two people I knew that, that had, hadn't had COVID yet now officially have COVID. 
So it spreads like wildfire. So what is going to happen as it starts to spread? Are they going to try to clamp back down? Based on the, the comment now on socioeconomic, it's unlikely. But again, we've seen things change before. First, they dropped the requirements stated in both March and May that officials must strictly implement COVID containment measures. Second, for the first time, they explicitly told officials to remove some restrictions once COVID-19 outbreaks are contained, which is something that was always uh, of conflict because they would hold some of these things for a long time that didn't make much sense. And third, they indicated that 20 uh, uh, specific adjustments for the policy would be issued imminently. So, but the, again, they, they're, the key development from this meeting was a slight but quite apparent shift in mindset to focus more on containing the fallout of the zero COVID policy itself. This is an important signal and may well tip off a series of small step adjustments to optimize the policy further over the next several months, but not get rid of it. And that's why it's important to look at, uh, at some policies. Now, what did the National Health Commission say because they released 20 measures tweaking some of these aspects? So first, you know, when you look at it, first, fewer people are likely to be put under lockdown and lockdowns will be lifted faster. Going forward, only individual apartment buildings with COVID cases will be locked down during outbreaks as opposed to the previous practice of locking down entire apartment co uh, complexes. So now they're just going to do buildings. So they're still locking down full buildings, but not the complex. Additionally, residents will be allowed to uh, leave lockdown after five days of no new cases emerging, down from the 10. So that's a positive. Fewer people will be packed off to uh, quarantine camps. Authorities will stop tracking down and quarantining secondary COVID contacts, individuals who have, who have been in contact with a direct contact of an infected person. Third, quarantine times will be reduced. Centralized quarantine periods for inbound travelers have been cut to five days from seven, followed by three days of home isolation. Centralized quarantine periods for first tier direct contacts of infected individuals were cut from seven to five days. So each of the adjustments is slight, but still meaningful. Despite these adjustments, officials were also crystal clear that the overall zero COVID policy and the number one priority of protecting people's health remains firmly in place. So it's important to, to counter that. But this, I think, uh, so Bloomberg Economics put out, you know, what could this mean? What, what as you start to see a reduction, and it, it could be meaningful. The problem is it's they're not getting rid of the COVID policy. This could be step one of a multi-step process to reduce it, but there's also that underlying economic headwind of trade and growth, which we outlined in segment one and segment five in last in yesterday's econ show that is going to weigh on things. So we do see this. This is is a, a nice little uplift to to uh, pot potential crude demand, but what kind of crude demand? Because we saw a big increase in imports. That's starting to to pare back again, cleaning up the remaining import quotas. And then what does this mean going forward? So we're really not going to have too much indication until we get into Q1 of next year. But we we still are very cautious because. The main impetus of what came out of the CCP Communist Congress was more of a focus on control and party orientation and less about growth, which is why I'm, I'm still concerned on what is that crude demand going to look like in the long term. When we look at things that have happened in the U.S., the 10-year versus three-month go government bond spread continues to widen. U.S. government bond curve, you can see it has been adjusted in terms of where things are. That's something that is going to be very volatile and not going to change anytime soon. We still think 50 basis points is very likely coming up, and I think that's now the consensus. So uh, that has also provided uh, a nice little 250-some-odd uh, you know, handle rally in the S&P 500. And then, uh, but you can still see there is that 10 year to three month bond spread that is a, a, a bigger concern that we have as we go into the end of this year. Consumer price index for all urban consumers, shelter uh, can, is now well above the average hourly earnings of production and uh, in, in, uh, in employees. When you look at the convergence, that is not something that is sustainable. So again, there's still that more downside on the asset level. 
Then when you look at commercial and industrialized loans, that's companies tapping into their credit facilities is going up. Uh, loans and leases, again, as you can see, continues to go to a new all-time high. So we're, it, it's just interesting to see them tapping into credit facilities. And, they, and typically, you know, you utilize everything before you have to file or before you go and talk to uh, shareholders and, and realistically bondholders. So what does this mean? Are they trying to lock in better rates because there's fear of it going up? Are they trying to avoid issuing debt and just tapping into credit revolvers because debt is, they're either being told the debt markets are closed, they're too expensive, but this is going to be important. And as this rises, watch for CapEx to come down, watch for those other pressure points and because they're going to start to reduce costs. And that's going to be important when you look at jobs and investment, again, speaking to that slowdown on the economic front. And then that all leads to the OECD leading indicators, again, coming uh, negative again and showing that contraction. Now it's at 98.5, and it's the lowest it's been. Obviously, COVID, but uh, when you go back to 2011, it's the lowest it's been since that point. So you know, more pressure ahead, more of those leading indicators showing the problems that are coming up which is, again, going to eat into some of that demand on the crude side, but you're still losing supply. So supply is still an issue, which is why stagflation is very apparent here. You know, not to, and this is kind of against the view that we're going to go to crude 200, but there's a lot of staying power of, of Brent 95, 97, you know, maybe 105, 102. There's a lot of staying power there. But it's just not going to go further up and then until we get a much bigger demand response to the downside, which would then bring prices down. But even then, you're not going to get a huge correction, which I think is going to keep things uh, a bit more painful, especially leading to that stagflationary front. So hopefully that was helpful. If you have any questions, you know, please let us know in the comments section or in, uh, uh, you can find me on Twitter. I always welcome any clarification that someone might have. Uh, I, I got some good feedback. I will try to provide some bullet points of how this all kind of all comes together because I know I talk a lot about data and it makes sense in my head and sometimes I'm not clear getting that across. So I apologize and I'll do that. Uh, I'll try to do a better job of making those connections. So thanks again for watching. Hopefully you have uh, a great weekend planned. I know it's going to be a bit wet. But, uh, you know, Sunday should, should clear up a bit. So thanks again for watching. I'm Mark Rosano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Prime Revision Network.